everyone. <laughs> Clicker, perfect, okay. Good morning, thank you so much for joining me so early today. Um, I am very excited to be here and thank you to the organizers at MyCon and especially Paul for having me. We are not easing into this morning. We are crashing straight in to a 30 minute crash course on what is the state of the current field of artificial intelligence. So thank you for being on this journey with me. So I wanted to start with actually a different question. Why is AI so confusing? And the reason is it actually refers to two different things. The first thing is the dream, the dream of the field. And this is the sci-fi rendition of a human-like embodied AI system that's super smart, super helpful, works with us to solve the world's biggest challenges. And this is the goal of the field. The second thing it refers to is the reality. Our basic AI systems today, like voice assistants, chatbots, Netflix recommendation systems, None of them are anywhere near the dream, and if you read, this was a hilarious thing that Siri did um, only three years ago. So today we've sort of separated these two concepts into two different terms. So the dream we refer to as artificial general intelligence, and the reality we refer to simply as artificial intelligence. But these definitions are often conflated, they get really confused, and that's why in the public imagination, artificial intelligence is seen as something that is more than what it really is today. Um, it's also confusing because the reality keeps changing. So it's getting better, getting closer to the dream, and that means the definition of AI is also changing. Um, so what we may have considered AI 20 years ago, we no longer probably consider it um, AI today. And so to really understand what AI is, we need to start with a little bit of history. So in the summer of 1956, a bunch of young white lads got together for an eight week retreat at Dartmouth University to figure out how to mimic intelligence with computers. It was basically a summer camp, they hung out every day and they hashed out various ideas. And this is seen by many people as the founding event for the field. And it was also the event that coined the term artificial intelligence. And so from that eight week summer camp, there emerged two different theories about intelligence. The first is we're smart because we know a lot of knowledge. And so if we want to recreate intelligence, we should encode all of the world's knowledge into a giant database and give birth to a super smart computer, otherwise known as an expert system. The second idea is that we're smart because we know how to learn. And therefore, if we want to create intelligence, we need to build software that can learn. And that is today what we know as machine learning. So eventually these ideas evolved into two different camps. There were the symbolists, and the connectionists. The symbolists are the knowledge camp, the connectionists are the learning camp, and the symbolists got busy converting the universe's knowledge into a set of logical rules. So it went something like this. They would tell the computer, birds can fly, robins are birds, and then the computer would logic out that robins can fly. Great. So the connectionists got busy designing software that could learn, and based on the basic principle that form fits function, they thought maybe we're really good at learning because we have brains. So if we want machines to be really good at learning, we should mimic the architectures between neurons and find a way to build those connections. And that's what gave birth to neural networks. So we'll get back to that later. Okay, so remember this happy cheery camp photo. That did not last very long because as these two camps evolved over time, they developed a very fierce rivalry. And it was basically like the bloods and the crypts of the AI world. So the connectionists thought the symbolists were stupid. The symbolists thought the connectionists were crazy. Um, and as a side note, the rivalry was so intense that it actually, this partition of ideas trickles into science fiction. So Samantha from her is very much an embodiment of idea number one, that intelligence comes from knowledge. She comes into the world fully imbued with all of the knowledge and capabilities of expression. In contrast, Chappie is very clearly idea number two. He is uh, he comes into existence with a completely blank slate and then he learns very quickly from his environment. And if you haven't seen those two movies, I would highly recommend it. So back to the story. So the symbolists um, and connectionists. In the beginning, the symbolists were winning. And so the connectionists actually looked pretty crazy. Um, expert systems were 
all the rage, especially after they achieved some very public major milestones. So you might have heard of this. In 1997, um, IBM created Deep Blue, and it was the first computer system to beat the world's greatest chess master. And in this photo, you see that a human is um, executing what Deep Blue decides to do because Deep Blue is just software. There's nothing to execute the actual moves. You may also remember this from 2011, um, when IBM Watson defeated the two best players on Jeopardy. Watson is also an expert system. And so for a long time in the public imagination, this is what AI was. It was these very, very knowledgeable machines. But then something happened. Symbolists started to hit a bit of a wall. Basically, if you want to try to distill all of human knowledge into a simple set of logical rules, it's actually really hard because you can say, birds can fly, robins are birds, robins can fly. But what about penguins? So there are lots of exceptions to the rules that we have in our world, and it gets really manually laborious to try and discover all of those exceptions and then encode them into the computer. And so symbolists ran into the issue of just not being able to deliver on their promises. It took very, very long to build these expert systems to do anything functional, and the costs started driving up, and funding for their projects went away. And that is when connectionists started to win. So because machine learning is essentially automating away the task of writing rules, instead of manually figuring out what the rules are, you give the machine a bunch of data, and the machine writes the rules for you. It is much faster, much cheaper, and much easier to adapt and readapt to new environments. And so here's an analysis I did earlier this year, which shows the frequency of words changing in AI research papers over time. And you can see that the terms associated with machine learning, like learning, network, data, those basically started to eclipse the terms that uh, are associated with knowledge-based reasoning somewhere around the mid-2000s. So there were two other things that happened to make this shift happen. The first was in 2006, a young computer science professor named Fei-Fei Li came up with an idea. She thought, what if we just drastically increase the amount of data that we feed machines? Then maybe machines will become more capable. And we kind of take this idea for granted today. Everyone says data is the new oil. But at the time, she was ridiculed for it, and it was a really radical idea. So what she did was she began an international effort based on this idea to capture the entire world of objects into a giant open source database of carefully annotated images. So it took two and a half years. They amassed 3.2 million um, photos, and that contained everything from animals to people to household objects, whatever you could think of, and Lee called it ImageNet. And then she launched a competition to basically see which team could use this data to then train the best image recognition system. So the second thing that happened is in 2010, another computer science professor named Jeffrey Hinton just, um, created a new design for a neural network. So if you remember, neural networks are the software that connectionists came up with to mimic the brain. But when it first came out, it wasn't very good. It was kind of stupid. It only had a few connections um, and few nodes, only one layer. And so it wasn't very good at processing images. And Hinton came up with the idea of, what if we essentially stack them and create what's known as a deep neural network with many layers. And suddenly, neural networks became a lot more powerful. They were able to pro uh, process much more sophisticated images. And that's what su spawned the subdivision of machine learning that we know today as deep learning, because it's the portmanteau of deep neural networks and machine learning. So both innovations combined led to a dramatic improvement in machines' abilities to recognize images. Um, you can see in here, this is a chart of the progress of the ImageNet competition. So in the first year, everyone was still quite far away from perfect accuracy. But in 2012, the first team, um, which was Hinton's team, used deep learning for the first time, and there was a pretty big leap in performance. So every year after that, um, at, through the competition's course, everyone started using deep learning, and very rapidly, practically all the teams by 2017 had reached near-perfect accuracy. So this was a very, very clear demonstration of the power of deep learning and what did that do for its popularity. It absolutely exploded. And now we don't just use deep learning for image recognition, as Paul mentioned. We use it for everything. 
Um, and this is, this is basically the AI hype cycle that, cycle that we are in today. So to recap, there are two theories of intelligence, knowledge and learning, and those each spawned their own branches of artificial intelligence, symbolic AI and machine learning. And uh, the learning sub-theory also spawned another theory that the brain structure is the reason why we as humans are smart, so we should replicate it by creating neural networks, and that is what gave us deep learning. Great. So now, everything, almost everything, that you hear is machine learning or deep learning. And symbolic systems are still around, but um, they're far less common. So, what is machine learning? The cut and dry um, of this is that machine learning is the process of using statistics to find patterns in data. And then the second part is it uses those patterns to then make decisions. So you can kind of think about it like humans, we, have, we live our experience, we learn lessons from those experiences, we then apply those lessons to our actions and decisions. Machines, the data is the experience for them, so they learn the lessons from the data and then apply those lessons to their actions and decisions. So, machine learning can be applied to image data, and it's extracting pixel patterns. You can feed it text data, and it'll extract word patterns. You can feed it audio data, it'll extract sound patterns. Essentially, any kind of data that you can put into digital form, you can feed into a machine learning algorithm, and it will find a pattern for you and then apply it as you wish. So there are two stages to machine learning. There's the training stage and the deployment stage. In the training stage, you take your data, you feed it into the algorithm, and it develops what we call a machine learning model. And that model is essentially the codified version of the patterns or the set of rules that the machine helped you write. And then you can take new data, put it into that model, and the model will compute what your desired output is. So here's a very simple example. Let's say you have data that is cat images. You feed it into a neural network, your algorithm, and the model is essentially the pixel patterns that make a cat a cat. So then you can go and feed it new data. Maybe you have an image of a muffin. You feed it into your model, and hopefully with some success, it will tell you that this is not a cat. So here's a pretty nice animation of this process happening. Um, here we have the neural network, that's the algorithm, and then we have both cat and dog photos that we're feeding in that are labeled, so we're telling it these are the cat photos, these are the dog photos, and it creates the model known as a trained neural network. And then that trained neural network can now tell you that this image is of a dog. So this process is actually really simple, but it's really powerful for a whole host of applications. So you can see that for image recognition, um, that's what drives face recognition. It's also what drives medical diagnosis, um, which is a really big budding field in artificial intelligence because a lot of medicine is based off of understanding and interpreting images like MRI scans or CT scans. Um, it drives speech recognition. So you can transcribe your voice. That's how, in part, you can communicate to Siri and Alexa. Um, and if you recently had your bank turn on voice identification where it essentially adds a security layer to uh, recognize your voice, that is also basically a form of speech recognition. Text prediction, prediction is like autocomplete or autocorrect on your phone. Um, ranking systems are the less obvious one. They are essentially the th systems that Google uses to organize the search results in your search feed and what Facebook uses to organize the um, posts in your newsfeed. So it's essentially taking data, which is your engagement and clicks from before, and finding the patterns that uh, help it predict what you might like to see first versus last. And then recommender systems is particularly important in marketing. It's the reason why um, you get very good product recommendations on Amazon, and it's also what's behind all of the targeted ads that follow you on the internet. So you might have noticed that each of these groups essentially try to mimic a human skill. As Paul mentioned before, these are all in quotes because they don't actually mimic it, uh, or they don't actually get to what it is, but they do uh, loosely mimic it. So image recognition is like sight, text prediction is like writing, so on and so forth. Um, and you can use this insight to then help you figure out what 
products use machine learning in the future. And so um, the flowchart that Paul was mentioning, this is something that I did last year to make a cheat sheet for myself for how to figure out if something is using AI. I won't go through all of it because it'll be included in the end of my slides. Um, but the top says, can it see, can it hear, can it read, can it move, can it reason? Um, and I encourage you to kind of make your own cheat sheet. This was my interpretation of how the different skills in AI break down, and it was a very useful exercise for thinking through what the field is currently accomplished. Okay, so this is the current state of the technology, but it's not exactly the dream. And I don't know if there are any The Good Place fans in the audience, but Janet is essentially this like amazing system, embodied AI system that helps the people around her. Um, so how far exactly is the dream? How far is Janet from becoming a real thing? If you remember the timeline from the beginning, this is essentially my interpretation of how far we are. So at the very far left is the 1956 Dartmouth camp. And the very far right is the dream that we're trying to achieve. I really don't think we are that far. Um, the current intelligence that we have, artificial intelligence that we have, is not even as intelligent as a two-year-old. Um, the th thing that Paul was talking about with his kids, his kids have this amazing ability to create these things from scratch. AI can never create things from scratch. It has to be fed initial data. It's always going to be a copycat, and it's always basically just trying to predict what happens next. And so um, this is a pretty big debate in the field, but based on the interviews that I conduct with researchers, I think most people would agree this is roughly where we are. We've barely moved a fraction of the way over. So how do we actually get to the dream? Well, one of the challenges in the field now is to integrate all of these skills. Um, you'll notice that all, all AI systems currently are singularly good at one thing, but we don't have AI systems that are very good at multiple things. And actually, Janet is a, a good illustration of one way that AI researchers are now attempting to bridge this divide. So the symbolists and the connectionists are trying to put aside their differences and combine both of their approaches together. And that kind of makes sense because human intelligence probably is the product of our knowledge and our ability to learn. And so it's a little bit like Janet in that she's infinitely knowledgeable in the show, but she also constantly evolves and learns with every iteration. There are also other challenges that need to be overcome. So here's another challenge, AI bias. And here's an example of what I mean by AI bias. So the most common image recognition systems are uh, much better at recognizing images from the US and Europe than from the rest of the world. So if you show it an image of a Western style wedding where the bride is wearing a classic white dress and the groom is wearing a tux, it will recognize that that's a bride and a groom and it's pro there's probably some ceremony happening. But if you show it an African style wedding or an Indian style wedding, it'll basically just say these are people. And there's a good reason for that. Um, after the huge success of ImageNet, there were a lot of people that rushed to create other open source image databases to help facilitate better image recognition systems. Um, but the, and the way that they went about building these databases is they essentially scraped whatever photos were available on the internet. And at the time when this happened, what was available on the internet was largely from the US and Europe. So this map shows a geographic distribution of one of the most popular open source databases. And you can see the, the biggest dots are from the US, the UK, and other countries in Europe. And there's basically nothing from Africa. And there are very, very few images from India. And so it makes sense that if the machines never saw any examples of African and Indian style weddings, then of course they're not going to be able to identify them. Um, so Google uh, last year is started addressing this problem by launching an inclusive images competition. And essentially what they are trying is both a data and algorithm approach to making our image recognition systems better at being uh, culturally sensitive. Um, so the data approach is they are trying to build more databases that actually have images from other regions of the world. And the algorithm approach is even if we have a limited or skewed data set, are there ways that we can use it anyway to build better inclusive image recognition systems? So here's another example from MIT researcher Joy Balamwini. At the start of her PhD, she discovered that commercial face recognition systems, the most common face recognition systems, did not even register her face. 
she had to wear a white mask for them to register. So she began to audit some of the most common systems and released a groundbreaking study last year called Gender Shades. What she found is that the three biggest companies that offer face recognition systems, um, IBM, Face++, and Microsoft, all had huge gaps in the ability to accurately classify the gender of a light-skinned man versus a dark-skinned woman. So IBM, in this case, had over a 34% gap between the two, but Facebook, Facebook, and Microsoft honestly weren't that much better. Um, she reconducted the study this year, including Amazon and Kairos, which just released their face recognition platforms, and it was the same exact thing. But fortunately, um, the three companies she audited originally actually improved because when she did the study, um, they reached out to her to figure out how they could do better. And so this really demonstrates that there's actually a way to do better, um, and there's a way forward. Um, here's a super recent example, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Um, this was in March when HUD sued Facebook. And they sued Facebook on two accounts. And I think the first account was more widely reported, which is that Facebook was allowing advertisers to um, target their advertisements based on race, national origin, gender, and that was causing all kinds of um, housing discrimination problems. But the second account, which is more interesting, um, is that even if an advertiser doesn't explicitly target their ads, the machine learning algorithms will do that anyway, because that's what they are designed to do. And so right after HUD, um, the lawsuit came out, there were researchers that then looked into this to see if it's true. And here's a study that was done where you can see the um, researchers created all of these housing ads, put it on Facebook without restricting the audience at all, and because the machine learning algorithm is optimized for profit and engagement, it ends up showing the homes for sale to a higher fraction of white users, whereas it shows the homes of, for rent to a higher fraction of minority users. And this holds true for employment as well. So without being prompted, the Facebook's machine learning algorithm is learning that if you want more engagement on your job ads for nurses and secretaries, you show it to a higher fraction of women, if you want more engagement on your job ads for janitors and taxi drivers, you show it to a higher fraction of minority users. So obviously, that is deeply problematic. And um, after this study came out, there was an, a great quote from a professor from University of Michigan, where he essentially said, da big data used in this way will never help us achieve a better world, because it is just replicating the patterns from history into the future. And so, there's a lot of research happening now to essentially figure out how to make AI systems not do this so that they achieve our dream of being beneficial to us. So the last challenge that I want to bring up, um, which has also gotten a lot of attention recently, is deep fakes. And deep fakes is also very, um, it exemplifies and illustrates really well the broader category of problems that relate to the abuse of AI. So what happens when you design systems and then they are used incorrectly? Um, deep fakes is a relatively new term, so it, it's a portmanteau of deep learning and fake media, um, and it, it refers to any kind of image that was created using deep learning. And the gist of it is that deep learning got so good at mimicking patterns in pixels that it can generate its own patterns and um, create hyper-realistic things that have never existed before. So here is an example where on the left you see Alex Baldwin impersonating Trump, and on the right you see President Trump's actual face being um, overlaid onto Alex Baldwin's body with a deep learning algorithm, and if you only saw the right-hand photo, you would just see Trump saying whatever Alex Baldwin wanted him to say. Um, here's another example with President Obama. So in this one, um, Jordan Peele is impersonating his voice, and the left-hand side of the image, the video is actually um, a video from Obama giving a national address, but the researchers took Jordan Peele's voice, synthesized the correct mouth movements for it to look like they were saying the same thing, and then overlaid it onto President Obama's face using a deep learning algorithm. So clearly this um, ability is a really big national security challenge because if politicians can be made to say anything, we're kind of screwed. Um, 
but it's not just for politicians that this is problematic. It's also already starting to be, in, be used in many different ways to affect vulnerable populations. So just last month, there was an app that was released called Deep Nude. It also used deep fake algorithms to essentially undress women or otherwise synthesize fake nude bodies um, and overlay them onto images of clothed women. And it was hugely controversial. Obviously, if this app, um, Fortunately, this app was taken down, but if this app had continued, it could cause a lot of grief to women who might be mistaken for having nudes on the internet. So as a final recap, what is AI? Well, cu currently today, AI is predominantly machine learning, and that means it's predominantly the process of finding patterns in data. But AI is also an aspiration. It's an entire field of people working to recreate intelligence so that it can help us solve challenges that we currently haven't figured out. Climate change, hunger, poverty, disease. And hopefully, when it does that, it'll help us all live happier, healthier, and better lives. But to get there, we have to overcome a number of challenges. We have to integrate all the skills together. We have to make sure that our systems are not biased. We have to get rid of the abuse of AI. But I'm optimistic that we'll get there. Thank you. So this is a bit.ly for the articles that I reference in my talk. I will probably add a, a few more later on. And it also has a link to my newsletter. Please subscribe if you would like to continue the conversation. It is completely free. Um, and it also has a link to the subscription for Tech Review if you would like to pay and continue the conversation. Thank you so much.